So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do over on Instagram, where all my links are kept, under Robin underscore Norgren, or at UBU for Life. Here's some words from a book called Awaken by Priscilla Shearer. And now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord, have blessed, and it is blessed forever. First Chronicles 17, 27. Could anyone other than David have been a more natural choice to oversee the construction of Israel's first permanent house of worship? Imagine the disappointment, perhaps even the confusion he must have felt when trying to digest the news He'd been given by the prophet Nathan that someone else would enjoy this honor instead. David was faced with the choice, either selfishly insist on fulfilling his own ambitions, or step aside and willingly pass on the baton to the one whom God had appointed to complete the task. He chose wisely. Instead of succumbing to hubris or acceding to selfish ambition, he cleared the way for the next one in line. He didn't scramble to maintain his position or usurp the assignment God had delegated to another. He trusted. He submitted. He finished well by not finishing. I wonder how many divine missions, mandates, and ministries are aborted by self-minded Christians who refuse to relinquish control of the task to those who follow in their footsteps. I wonder how many worthy pursuits have lost their spiritual relevance and vitality because someone greedily clung to their personal ownership of it rather than cheerfully stepping aside, encouraging its growth and maturity into a new generation. One of the more difficult nuances of victorious Christian living is that of staying sensitive to the spirit of timing, of knowing when the spirit is whispering Enough now, my child. Only a truly humble heart will comply when it's time to let others carry the reins of responsibility forward while their own assignment shifts to another role. But just as an Olympic relay is dependent on each successful exchange of the baton, so are churches, ministries, families, and visions dependent on faithful leaders who will yield power when it's someone else's turn to carry the torch. Finishing well can sometimes mean not seeing the full end of what you started, but rather stepping away so others can share in the victory of the race well run. The fact is, the glorious building that rose from the city of David is still remembered, all these centuries later, as Solomon's Temple. Before its demoralizing destruction at the hand of pagan invaders centuries later, its opulence was known far and wide as being reminiscent of its builder's esteem. Solomon's Temple. And yet Solomon's success was largely due to David's selfless release and also to something more, something bigger, beautiful, and staggering in its generosity. According to 1 Chronicles 22, David used the remainder of his life to collect the materials, delegate the workforce, fund the expenses, and enthusiastically validate his son before the entire nation. He paved the path for his replacement success. 
not everything is yours to finish. Many tasks of great kingdom importance may not be fully synchronized with your own lifetime or your particular generation. Still choose to be grateful and be a part of what God is doing by fully investing yourself in his greatest worth. Yes, the work is his, and since it is, release it back to him whenever he asks you to, trusting that the scope of it will be beyond your wildest imagination. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Hebrews 12, 1, 2. Kim Rosen writes in her book, Saved by a Poem. At the Woman in Power conference where I met Dr. An Maya Angelou, I also met the dynamo spoken word poet, C.C. Carter. C.C. was there to receive an award from an organization called V-Day, which works to stop violence against women and girls all over the world. She was being honored for a, a miracle she created on Chicago's South Side. Every Tuesday, up to 100 people crowd into Lee's unlit, unleaded blues club to cheer each other on in an evening of spoken word poetry and community. Most, if not all, are survivors of violence, abuse, or incest, and most, but not all, are women. The heart of what gathers them together is the need to give voice, as only poetry can, to what has remained unspoken and unspeakable. Women who have never before felt safe enough to talk about their lives take their microphone as the rest of the people cheer, laugh, and cry to hear their own hopes and fears, wounds and wildness given voice. The gathering is organized by CC's organization, Pow Wow, which is an acronym for Performers or Writers for Women on Women's Issues. Those who crowd into the club receive healing even beyond the poetry spoken there. We know women survivors have a hard time with being touched, Cece explained to me. And we know that many of the women have not experienced a positive feeling all week long. They've been stressed out at their job or unappreciated in their family. So we start the evening by going around to every single woman and telling her, we are glad you are here. We are glad you made it. We are glad to see you back for another week. And we hug everybody. When Cece receives the award, she takes the mic with the grace of a master conductor picking up a baton. One shoulder bare, the rest of her wrapped in a red silky dress just tight enough to show off her voluptuous hips. She raises one hand high above her head as if calling even the air to attention. She gives no acceptance speech. Instead, she does what she has made possible for many others, which has earned her championships across the country. She dives right into one of her poems and takes us, the audience, with her. What is it that you misunderstand about these hips? My hips? These are my hips. These 46-inch hips. Attached to this 24-inch waist are my hips, and they tell her story. Perhaps you question the size of my hips. The second largest continent in the world sired these hips. Of course they would be as large. The oldest civilization on earth gave birth to these hips. Of course they would be as wide. Several stanzas later, as she careens toward the finish of the poem, the audience is on its feet, screaming and stamping. Cece rides the swells of sound as if she spent lifetimes surfing the roar of 750 women, all shouting at once. She is glowing. By the end of her poem, each of us is wishing our hips were even wider and could swirl and flounce and pump and flutter like Cece's. As we leave the auditorium, I'm sure that I am not the only big-hipped woman to sashay a bit more sensually toward the dining hall for the first time in my life, feeling a little luckier and sexier than my less-endowed friends. 
Cece was not always so at home in herself and her body. At the age of 11, she wanted to die. Her father was a minister and had to change parishes frequently, so her family was constantly moving. Every time she got, we got comfortable in a place and I finally started to make friends, he got a new church, Cece told me. On top of that, her body started to change. I was from a family of very full-figured women. My grandmother was a Hottentot, Cece explained to me, that this was the name of a tribe from southwestern Africa whose women became famous for their wide hips. They were horrifically mistreated in sideshow attractions when imported to Europe in the early 19th century. I developed these hips at 11, she says, and walking in the world like that was not safe. Children can be cruel. Walking down the hallways, boys would grab me. Adults would chastise me. Even my family would say, if you keep it up, you'll be shaped just like your grandmother. Cece's grandmother took care of her on Tuesdays and Thursdays. She was this amazing poet who had given up everything for her family. One day, years earlier, when Cece was in the third grade, a chance homework assignment opened up the world of poetry between them and they forged a connection that would guide Cece's life. I came home with a poem by Langston Hughes, Hold Fast to Dreams. I was supposed to learn it by heart for my assignment. That's when we discovered that we had this hidden language that bonded us. Later, Cece wrote about what happened that afternoon. I didn't understand the intention of the poem, what it meant to hold fast to dreams. Grandma said that was because I was mumbling, trying to learn it under my breath. You can't feel a poem just by reading it. You've got to speak the, the poem, act out the poem. Then you can know its true meaning. And then in the mirror, watching her perform In the Morning by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, entirely by memory, that's when I realized my grandmother was magic. Cece and her grandmother spent hours in front of the mirror practicing poems together. But as she grew older, crushed under the accumulated stress of repeated moves and the merciless teasing and disrespect she endured as her body changed, Cece gradually started to shrink into herself, hiding her shape in oversized clothes, hiding her feelings behind a veil of depression. Her withdrawal culminated one day in eighth grade when she came home utterly devastated. She didn't want to return to school. She didn't want to live. I literally wanted to check out of here. My grandmother sensed this and gave me Dr. Angeli's poem, Phenomenal Woman. She told me to put it on my mirror. And every morning before I walked out of my room, I was to read it. And every night after I said my prayers, I was to say it out loud. That poem saved Cece's life. Its medicine brought her back to herself from the barrage of insults, invasion, and loneliness she faced at school. After that, every time Cece met some kind of obstacle, her grandmother would prescribe a poem that would be the perfect medicine. Mostly, they were Maya Angelou's poems. I learned how to use poetry to silence my enemies, spouting off to the bullies in the hallway, you may write me down to history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Or to the mean, snotty girls, pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. Every time I hit an obstacle, there was Dr. Maya Angelou and a poem and my grandmother. After her grandmother's death, C.T.C. became a nationally recognized performance poet. Like Maya Angelou, every time she took the stage, she brought her grandmother with her. She'd hear the familiar voice, hold your head up, look right in the mirror. Then her grandmother would merge into her, and she would fulfill the dream they had shared. Mary Oliver's poem called Mindful. Every day 
I see or I hear something that more or less kills me with delight that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy, in acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the ocean shine, the prayers that are made out of grass. Thank you.